Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting the next session in one minute. So good morning, everyone, and it's good to see you here uh, on an early Sunday morning. My name is Michael Bailey, and I'm Director of Program Delivery at Katy. And uh, we've had the great pleasure this last few days in collaboration with CAR to do a learning institute um, and a community rapporteur session, which is right now, called Learning at the Front Lines. Um, and our group of, of people includes 12 CAR scholars, uh, 12 who are from across Canada, 12 Katy scholars, uh, mostly from Atlantic Canada, and several people who've uh, added on as uh, time as the Learning Institute started mostly surprisingly who've done it before. And I say surprisingly because it's, uh, it's a great commitment that people have made to do this. Um, all of the people in our Learning Institute work in community organizations. Some of them came across the country and uh, spent the whole day getting here. Um, and many of them will be at work tomorrow morning because in smaller community organizations, uh, you can't really have somebody away for very long. Um, First of all, I'd like to just ask the people, the, the uh, rapporteurs, the, the, the ally participants, uh, if they could stand up so people could see who they were. Um, and they, you probably noticed that there were people with Katie folders uh, over the three days, the two days of the conference, um, writing notes, copious notes uh, on sheets yeah. of paper. And these are those people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so we met as a group um, three times over the three days of the conference, um, mostly just to hash out what we'd seen. Um, we split into the four groups of the four tracks, um, and in the evenings after the conference, got together with our notes and, and discussed what we thought was important from that community lens. And uh, the discussions were very interesting because community workers, these were people who come from organizations that serve different, uh, different uh, populations of people. So there was a lot of give and take. Um, there weren't very many people from large Canadian cities, so it, it, was, it was good to see how community work works in, uh, in smaller and rural uh, locations. Um, on our first evening, we had a couple of, uh, of additional knowledge translation speakers, and I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Niora Pick um, and also uh, Dr. Connie Kim, a postdoctoral student uh, from, uh, who's working in Toronto General Hospital with uh, Dr. Sharon Walmsley and Dr. Rupert Paul. And they brought that information closer to us and uh, actually showed us some techniques of, of explaining some of the basic science, which I'm sure will be mentioned. Um, so, I'm going to hand it over to the people from who are representing the tracks here, uh, each of their groups, and uh, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and their track, and um, and we'll try to get through this in half an hour. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Abby Jackman. I'm with the AIDS Committee of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, and I'm going to be uh, kind of summarizing the basic sciences stream. And a disclaimer that I am very much not a basic scientist, and everyone in the group was also not a basic scientist. So that's kind of the beauty of the Learning Institute, where you're, you're engaging with material that's not necessarily um, in your field, but you're using it to, to understand how it relates to your work. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of go through what we took as some important points um, from the basic sciences stream. Um, so while, uh, while it was often very difficult to understand um, the, the basics of basic science, um, it can allow people who are, are living with HIV to have a better idea of, of what's going on in their bodies and to, to, help make, uh, to help them make more informed decisions about their health. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting uh, basic sciences research happening at this conference uh, all across Canada. 
um, and people are engaging, people, sorry, people are engaged and the, they're looking for solutions in innovative and novel ways. Um, so here are points that stood out for us. <clears throat> Maybe. Um, so uh, now that we have an effective, effective medications to help control HIV infection, um, we seem to be moving in a direction uh, that focuses on reservoirs. Um, even when a person's viral load is undetectable, uh, the virus can still be stored in reservoirs in the body, including the brain. Um, Margola's plenary presentation uh, showed us that um, extracting these latent viruses or um, latent cells is very challenging and that we're very likely years away from having all the answers, but at the same time, understanding reservoirs holds the promise for eradicating HIV. Um, and the future of anti-latency therapy may result in, uh, in different regimens for people who are living with HIV. Um, so we asked the question, will, will this make treatment easier or harder for people who are living with HIV? Uh, given all the uncertainty and possible toxicity associated with these treatments, will people be willing to try these new drugs or to interrupt their HIV treatment? Um, during one of the oral presentations, we, we, we discussed Poon's work as, as being interesting and in how, it, how it, uh, looking at how different uh, infections are historically related. Um, he looked at clusters as groups of, of genetically related HIV infections uh, that allow us to track how viruses are transmitted. Um, and this can be useful when it comes to identifying communities that are more at risk um, and developing uh, effective prevention programs. So we, we asked the question, can this lead to further marginalization and persecution of communities if we know who's, tra who's transmitting to whom? Uh, another another major uh, finding, I guess, that was presented during this conference was uh, Dr. Mark Weinberg's work on on his his new drug, um, and he uh, yeah, HIV drugs interact with different f uh, phases of the HIV virus, um, including integration and replication in the cells. So drug resistance can occur uh, when the virus mutates into a form that can't be countered by, medica uh, countered by medication. And this new drug seems to be promising as a medication for people who have never taken treatment. Um, naive patients um, have not developed resistance so far. I think it was a f in a four-year trial, so that seems like a very potentially promising treatment. Um, we, also, we also found uh, talks on elite controllers to be very interesting who are able, they're able to control the virus and maintain an undetectable viral load without uh, taking any medications. Um, so we asked what can their experience of the virus uh, in the body teach us? Um, another interesting study was on, um, on, on breast milk, uh, and breastfeeding. And while the official recommendations in Canada advise uh, that positive women should not breastfeed, um, there are questions about the positive effects of breastfeeding. Um, so the health, comes out, out, health outcomes are better for babies who are breastfeeding exclusively as opposed to mixing uh, breastfeeding and formula feeding as Rosenthal uh, discussed in his oral presentation. Um, and human breast milk does possess many antiviral properties, uh, many of which play a role in preventing vertical transmission. Um, so that, that poses, a, we pose the question, will that, uh, will that mean that we will begin recommending that positive women uh, breastfeed their children in the future? And we even learned about crocodile blood, which was very unexpected. <laughs> um, um, Dr. Dr. Branch discussed how crocodiles have a very strong immune system um, and Began to, he has begun to study the antimicrobial properties of crocodile blood. Um, and what we found most interesting about this, this, um, this research was actually the community involvement piece. Um, this piece of research was brought to him by a high school student um, who was interested in studying crocodiles. Um, and we kind of took that as, as a way in which research doesn't have to be um, strictly basic science is strictly, you know, um, limited to people who study science. It's, it just kind of showed that um, everyone does have a role to play in research. <clears throat> and in conclusion, um, 
basic HGV science research is an incredibly active field um, that directly impacts the lives of people who are living and who are um, at risk of HIV. So there is a lot of hope when it comes to better understanding HIV, treating HIV, and eventually eradicating HIV. And with that, we'd like to thank, offer thanks to people who are involved um, as donors, as patients, and as animals within these studies, as well as the organizers of the CAR conference and the Katy uh, Learning Institute for this opportunity to better understand the basic science aspect of HIV research. Thank you. Hi and good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Luyombia Henry and... Oh, Natasha Podvin. I'm from uh, the Committee for Access for AIDS Treatment in Toronto, downtown. I am also a social worker. I work as a research coordinator for the CHAMP study at the Committee for Access for AIDS Treatment. Uh, before I start our presentation on clinical sciences, I wanted to firstly acknowledge uh, my team members who helped us put together this uh, presentation. Although we are co-presenting, this is a team effort, and uh, mm -hmm. including people who put up the slides. And also uh, to CI, uh, not CIHR, Ka and uh, <laughs> Katie for facilitating us to get here. Uh, for the last three, four days, it's been an amazing experience, and uh, I thank you for that opportunity. So um, in terms of clinical sciences, um, We'll be looking at HIV prevention as well as uh, assorted other issues. Um, we'll start with the general reflection and then go to uh, the meds and then co-infection. So, so we have three slides and we will try to do it in five minutes that we've been given. So generally throughout the presentations, uh, results were showing that actually clinical scientists have done a good job uh, trying to reach out. Uh, and, and evolve our community partners. So although they're in the lab, sometimes in their clinics, uh, there is uh, some sort of collaboration even outside uh, the clinical uh, aspects. Um, also, uh, we, we saw that there was some sort of expanded partnerships uh, uh, with the clinical researchers working with social scientists. Uh, one of the presentations uh, talked about uh, reaching out even beyond Canada and establishing contacts in uh, countries like South Africa and uh, Uganda to still look at uh, HIV uh, in our communities. And uh, the other thing uh, that kind of stood out from generally the presentations that there was uh, little uh, representation from uh, women, uh, particularly women who are living with HIV or women who are co-infected or women who uh, sex workers, so I thought we needed to know that. And so in terms of the medication, uh, we've had some successes. Um, the presentations are focused around giving us how HIV uh, meds have really improved the quality and quantity of life for people living with HIV, and particularly uh, the quad has been effective um, as well as, uh, as, well as as compared to, to the triple therapy. And uh, although we have had some successes, there's a few issues that uh, we'll, be speaking out in the, we'll be speaking about in the next few minutes uh, to, to kind of show the other side of uh, medication. And also it seems that uh, the quad has been effective as a boosted PI uh, plus Truvada. So I'm gonna say my part in French. Um have your slide in English. So, avant de penser au traitement, uh, nous devons nous assurer des besoins de base. Uh, C'est très, très, très important dans les traitements, uh, dont le logement, la sécurité uh, alimentaire, la santé mentale, le soutien social, incluant les groupes de pairs, uh, la famille, les amis et les groupes d'entraide. De plus, uh, le langage peut présenter uh, un obstacle très important au traitement. Uh, il a été prouvé que le taux de réussite uh, Le taux de réussite était plus élevé lorsque le service était offert dans la langue, euh, euh, la langue maternelle ou la langue appropriée. And so, some studies also looked at co-infection, HIV and HCV, 
and uh, there was a real concern about the new treatment for HCV. Um, there was uh, studies that looked at um, successes in treatment of uh, HCV, but also uh, people were reminded to be mindful of this success because uh, um, harm reduction still needs to be continued even when uh, the sustainable, sustained uh, virological response, uh, the cure for, uh, for H uh, HCV is there. So we need to continue engaging our patients in that. And also uh, there was a fear of uh, reinfection um, whereby uh, it seems not to, it seems like it's not as much as, uh, as a concern as earlier on feared. And uh, a port or weed uh, does not speed up progression of end stage liver disease. Um, so uh, one of the studies was looking at um, marijuana as one of the options, but uh, in terms of uh, the liver damage, uh, studies were saying that uh, uh, we need, uh, although there is uh, some sort of liver damage uh, in the system, uh, we still need to continue uh, in gi giving uh, patients uh, what they need in terms of, uh, you know, all the right information and also all the correct um, sort of uh, li linking up uh, with other forms of, of care. And um, this is the last point. Uh, there was some sort of a good model to do this. Uh, there was a pop-up clinic um, as a good model for uh, encouraging one point or single point care of testing, whereby uh, uh, studies looked at uh, uh, trying to pilot test um, clinics that would have all the services in one point so that, uh, you know, patients don't have to move here and there to access services. Yeah, and also this clinic is the example for the, the barrier of the language. So uh, it's in Vancouver and I think it was like the good point of uh, this conference. Yeah, so, so in a nutshell, I think uh, with those reflections, we see that uh, I think clinical sciences is really, really much needed today and even, t and even tomorrow. We just have to kind of focus on, you know, building coalitions with basic scientists, uh, social scientists, and other AP people. I thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Guyberson, and I am from St. John, New Brunswick, and I work with AIDS St. John. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here, especially the morning after Rally in the Alley. I'm impressed that there's as many of you here as there is. Um, I also want to say thank you so much to Katie for this opportunity. It was a great, great chance. Um, as somebody who works in community, um, being evidence-based and evidence-informed, which is the f I've, I've never heard evidence-informed before, and I thought that was a brilliant term, um, is so important. And this is an opportunity for us to actually get that evidence and to go home and actually be able to use it. Um, so we're... Oh. So I did track C, which was the epidemiology and public health track, um, which was actually really, really interesting and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, there were a few sort of themes that kind of stood out for us. Um, one of the things that I must say, I have discovered that at this point we're all walking acronyms. That's all, <laughs> everything we talk about is an acronym. Um, I'm pretty sure I've said multiple sentences that had four acronyms in them or five acronyms in them this whole conference. Um, and that can be a real barrier. And there were a few sessions that talked about it. There was actually one session where their quote was, stop creating, acronym, uh, stop creating acronyms and disseminate in-depth knowledge, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so one of the quotes that I really loved from, was from the plenary. And they said, starting art is a lifelong commitment to interacting with a strained healthcare system. Now they were talking about Zambia and South Africa, but I feel like that could very, very easily be um, applied here and be sort of, um, it's, it's one of the few things I think is truly universal is the healthcare systems are quite, uh, quite strained and it's, um, it's certainly something I think that we could uh, take home. Um, one of the other interesting things about the healthcare system is we talk, we've talked about how men don't access the healthcare system as much as women, but it's not necessarily set up to serve the needs of women or serve the needs of Aboriginal peoples or serve the needs of people who use drugs or serve the needs of... And so I think we really need to question the system and actually say, 
is the system working? Because who's it working for? I, one of the things I found in the research, I didn't hear a single group stand up and say the healthcare system is working beautifully for me. Um, so definitely something to kind of have in mind. Um, there was some really interesting stuff going on around silos, and it's something that we see as somebody from community. Um, some of the language that was used, I, I could barely understand it. And so it, there's definitely some siloing happening. And it's one of the things that we actually talked about. Um, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. I think that's on the next slide. But it's one of the things we actually talked about is um, changing the language and actually um, uh, translating between the different silos. Um, one of the really neat things, they were, this plenary was talking about treatment as prevention. Um, and it, it was kind of from, I'm from a health promotion background. That's where I'm, uh, where sort of my bread and butter. Um, and it was really interesting to hear that there are pros to silos. We've, I've always been told that silos are bad and you don't want those. Um, but it was kind of interesting when they were talking about um, treatment and prevention and how we normally view those things as two separate things and now there's all the stuff that's integrating them. Um, but there is some challenges there because that often places the onus on people living with HIV uh, as the ones who have to protect other people, which is not, uh, not necessarily the way that should go. Um, a lot of issues with stigma. Stigma is alive and well, unfortunately. It, it's a thing. Um, and it certainly continues to be alive and well and hopefully will not be soon. Um, so there was a couple of really great documents launched at the conference, um, and a lot of them seem to be in the epi track. Um, there was the uh, recommendations for HIV research in women, trans people, and girls. Um, really good research po creates more questions than it answers, right? It's that, so what do we do next? What should I know? <laughs> Um, and this is one of those cases where they had 31 recommendations and most of those were we need to know more about, about this, we need to make sure that the research is representative, we need to um, really make sure that the, it's, um, it's serving the, the people that are, that are being researched as well. Um, oh yes, and see this was my point about the, the language and how it has to translate across um, the different fields. Um, there was a lot um, talked about with trauma, and trauma at all levels, trauma at the individual level, trauma at the community level, trauma um, at even the national level. So it was really, really interesting. And as someone who works in community, that's something that we've seen and we talk about. And so it's really great to now have this piece of evidence in our, my hand that I can go back and be like, we were right, this is a thing. Um, so it's really, really great to have that. Um, I will say one of the uh, one of the things about these conferences is the opportunity to network and the opportunity to actually um, chat with people and sort of get different points of view. And um, yesterday I, we were at a session with the Katy Institute and um, I was talking about this great quote where um, this person was talking about life-threatening vulnerabilities and um, I had someone say, yes, but who are you to tell me that I'm vulnerable? And I thought, well, that's a really good point. Um, and one of the things that I did find happens quite a bit, and I, this was pointed out to me yesterday as well, is the concept of Aboriginal people and Abor Ab Aboriginal persons, and they tend to be grouped together. I didn't see a lot of separation. There was no acknowledgement that there are many, many communities within the Aboriginal population. Um, so I thought that was really good. And the other, the, 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 um, that was pointed out to me, that they need to be separated out more and acknowledged. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the times, um, what we research is the negative, right? So it's important to remember that these communities are strong and there are these huge strengths, but we tend to research the negative. And if you only focus on the negative, it can be really, really um, dehumanizing for people. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and the other thing too, um, a lot of the times people doing work with the Aboriginal communities are not an Aboriginal person. And so here I am as a white person once again talking on behalf of these communities. Um, but it's really, really important to understand that, that 
it's not my place to stand here and tell you about their communities. It's their place to talk about their own communities if they so choose. That's my soapbox for the morning. A great new term that I, um, that I heard about was um, culturally safe. I thought that was great. Um, I've heard uh, of, of um, cultural sensitivity and all these, but I thought culturally safe was a great term. Um, and it is really, really important to be culturally safe in your service provisions. Um, and I think probably my favorite quote of the conference is this one. So someone said, one glass slipper for everyone. When you try to force everyone to, into the same size, some people break the slipper. And I thought that was also a very, very powerful image because it's true. And the way our system is set up, because we're trying to please everyone, we sometimes please no one. And um, most people don't fit into that glass slipper. Um, so definitely matching and tailoring your approach and tailoring within your, uh, within your programming is hugely important. So once again, thank you so much for having me. It was, it's been a great conference. And um, yeah. <laughs>So as a decolonizing practice, we just want to acknowledge the uh, Mi'kmaq uh, traditional nations. We're all guests on here. My name is Robert Birch. I'm a board of director from the Vancouver Island Persons with AIDS Society. I'm a new doctoral researcher at uh, UVic with the Social Dimensions of Health program and a doctoral student with the Momentum Health Study in Vancouver. And I'm reporting on track D, the social sciences. We wanted to uh, start uh, discussing a little bit about the social sciences and really position ourselves with in uh, Dr. Richard Parker's work from Columbia uh, University, uh, looking at why do the social sciences matter. And we also want to acknowledge within that we had 28, like all of us, had 28 oral presentations and over 20 posters synthesized down in five minutes. So as we all know, not everybody gets to kiss the cod. Um, <laughs> But here we are. So uh, we're looking at the social sciences and, and where it sits in the other disciplines uh, would not, and these other disciplines wouldn't be as effective nor as engaging in their implementation without the construction of solidarity, quote, and the importance of cultural activism, the social interaction and networks that are built and the communities and the community support structures that the social sciences offer to everybody. So we looked at this, we working with a great team and we got into a lot of rich debate around some of the material we were engaging. So as a way to introduce some of uh, our time here today is looking at the notion of culture making practices versus culture controlling practices where we've got harm reduction and harm induction. So that's the way we're gonna look at some of the material we came up with here today. So uh, another key feature was evolving identities over the history of HIV and how how people are also claiming their spaces at the table of policy and analysis. And we certainly saw that strongly in the, the case of women and black heterosexual men and uh, indigenous cultures and newcomers to Canada. And that felt like it was a, a strong theme that was emerging. Um, so uh, we also really want to acknowledge the peer-driven processes and putting PHAs at the, the central function of all this work. Uh, Dr. Richard Parker really talked about how community-based cultural meaning-making approaches uh, have been the most effective model in the history of this disease and yet are very much absent from the, the current combination prevention model. And that's something to seriously ponder in our work as we move forward. Um, and he also talked about that the social sciences have uh, really far evolved beyond being a handmaid into other disciplines. He looked at this notion of necessary fictions. Are we finished with HIV as the end of AIDS? Uh, how it's necessary to strategically use these necessary fictions to help us simply to imagine what needs to be done. Uh, and a way to engage people in this meaningful struggle, but to really acknowledge the truth that we are not closer to a cure. So looking at some of the oral abstract sessions, moving beyond at-risk and hidden populations. 
Again, this notion of pure education on safer sex and drug use as, as a natural and organic process. These are communities that have inside experience that are not just valued, but absolutely necessary. And this parallels the whole community-based research, participatory research project. We really feature the, the Getting Foxy and the Inuit Process IQ, where traditional knowledge um, is integral to the success of these projects, but is a culture-making practice. Um, creative branding came up uh, by respected local artists, how this can really mobilize community efforts. Again, this notion of identities enriching the experience and rippling out and having a greater impact than some of the research silos we've seen in the past. Uh, again, this notion of MSM, uh, game by men, uh, who look for sex online and these new designations and identities that are emerging and how that l online practice is putting men at greater risk and there's much more need for sexual promotion in these areas. Some of the posters we looked at. So again, with so many posters, we really wanted to feature two pieces and send out a, a notion with this. We had the hand stories, a visual, a visual imaginative methodology for the representation of erotic narr narratives and sexual HIV risk amongst Latino gay men in Toronto. So here we want to say the method is the message. Uh, that these visual components that really awaken people's imagination of how this disease operates in our lives and in our communities is, is something, as many of us are practitioners in the field, it's awakening our imagination, giving us more agency and permission to work within our communities in really fresh ways. Reaching people where they are, peer distribution of harm reduction supplies. Again, not a new idea, but, we're, but what's important about it is we keep moving in this direction of involving more people at the table. Aboriginal persons with uh, HIV. Uh, leadership interventions. Again, everybody coming to the table and claiming their space. So um, we also want to just gently and lovingly, if I may say this, recommend to some of the presenters that uh, it may look good on your computer, but when it gets up on a large screen, uh, we really need you to maybe take a look at that just so the font size and the colors are working. So that's just our way of saying it would help us help you. Um, <laughs> Uh, oral, <laughs> thank you, uh, living with HIV, great team we're working with, living with HIV and living with GIPA. Again, what are the structural factors that impact the successful reintegration into the work world of PHAs? And of course, we're looking at elements of housing and drug benefits and the potential loss of that. So how do we make these transitions from one identity that used to be patient and then moved into uh, peers and now evolving back into new notions of working and contributing in society in new and evolving ways? We need much more support in those areas. This idea of geographical proximity can still provide a barrier. And Alison Carter's work of saying available care does not mean accessible care. So uh, we also saw that in the red zones uh, when people are, are uh, pushed out uh, of those zones by police. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But how do we access care when it does not feel safe to us? A key, key idea of, uh, that we're trying to work with more. Structural stigma, we looked at uh, symbolic stigma, uh, Marilou Gagnon, but really she featured a lot about the structural stigma being embedded into the healthcare system as a whole. This is not obviously okay, um, where uh, some of the pa people coming in to receive care are, are being asked about uh, being asked, why did you not share your status earlier so we could infect our, our medical instruments longer? What? Right, so this structural stigma is something that, again, we need to work at evolving cultural practices within the healthcare system. And moving on to the third abstract session of social, structural, and systemic drivers, the context of risk. So there was a lot of really lovely work on um, peer research assistance, adding, not only adding value and richness to the HIV research, but again, this notion of evolving identities and emerging. I think of it as a rite of passage process where we've gone through difficulties and crises and we've learned so much along the way. And as we return back to our community, the larger community, we have skills to share within that community. So again, uh, the, the wheels need to be greased a little bit more in this area. And the work that's being done is nuanced, caring, and creating a, a healthy shared vulnerability between uh, professional researchers and evolving research class. Uh, these red zones, compromising your ability to survive. So these, these zones are being created by the police force. 
and they're being, people are being compelled during times of detoxing to agree to staying into these red zones. Again, this is not okay. We're needing more political mobilization around this. Um, uh, these red zones, are, again, are the places where people are accessing care. So this is a, this is a mess that needs addressing. Uh, this notion of undetectable as an emerging, um, as a new primarily online MSM identity with significant implications for gay, bi, and M uh, men who lust for men and our sexual strategies. So again, this is needing a lot more attention because it's changing the landscape. And as Trevor Hart said, what do we do with this? So how is how the people in the field and the, as practitioners working with this evolving culture around undetectable and how gay men primarily are working within this experience and making up the rules and we need to be catching up a lot faster within that process. And finally, the last abstract on intersectional framing of HIV and sex and gender. Trans people are statistically invisible in Canada. Makes me think back to the ACT Up dates. That's all I'd like to say about that. The government is fueling HIV stigma as a result of criminalization of non-disclosure. Again, the state controlling culture rather than supporting it. Criminalization of sex buyers puts sex workers at increased risk of violence. Again, surveillance deterring the help that we're all here trying to do. Uh, finally, I just want to also do, put a shout out to the 70 scientists who stood up and represented PHAs across this country on criminalization and stood up and I'm getting emails across North America in the last day saying, wow, Canada. So thank you. Can we just applaud the scientists who got up and did that for us? I also want to just acknowledge a little nod to Kathy Worthing, to who many of us know and adore on the uh, West Coast right now, around updating our thinking. And it's a, updating a cliche, if nothing else. We've all heard, you know, it's not rocket scientists, figure it out. Well, she suggests we change it to it's not social science, right? So we are working in a complex, rich field that is changing the way we think and perceive the world. Thank you to Carr and Katie Learning Institute for making this a rich experience for all of us. So I'd like to, to thank our rapporteurs for doing an excellent job, and uh, that's it for us. Uh, one final um, uh, uh, thank you to Thomas Eggdorf, who is here, who is the Katie person who organized this learning institute. Um, the organizers have told me that there's coffee outside and we'll be reconvening for the next session uh, in five minutes. Thank you.